This is Nelson Olmstead. Sleep no more. Think back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror. Told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmstead, tell us about this evening's story. Once in a while in my reading, I come across a short story so different, so powerful, so well written, that I can't forget it. Our first story tonight is a case in point, written by one of England's masters of the short story art, A.M. Burridge. It's about a man who went out of his way to scare himself to the absolute limit. Listen while I tell you about the waxwork. While the uniformed attendants of Marimer's Waxworks were ushering the last stragglers through the great glass panel double doors, the manager sat in his office interviewing Raymond Hewson, a journalist. The manager was speaking. Yes, uh, Mr. Hewson. It uh, used to be said years ago that Madame Tussauds would give a man a hundred pounds for sleeping alone in the Chamber of Horrors. I uh, hope you don't think that we've made any such offer, Mr. Hewson. However... If you get your story printed in the morning, Echo, there will be a five-pound note waiting for you here when you care to come and call for it. Well, that's uh, satisfactory. Fine. But, uh, first of all, it's no small ordeal that you're proposing to undertake. I'd like to be quite sure about you, and I'd like you to be quite sure about yourself. I own I shouldn't care to take it on. I've seen those wax figures dressed and undressed, and I know all about the process of their manufacture. I can walk about in their company downstairs as unmoved as if I were walking among so many Skittles. But I should hate having to sleep down there among them, alone. Well, why? I don't know. There isn't any reason. I don't believe in ghosts. It's just that I couldn't sit alone among them at night with their seeming to stare at me the way they do. No, the... Whole atmosphere of the place is unpleasant. And if you are susceptible to atmosphere, I warn you that you are in for a very uncomfortable night. Hewson had known that from the moment when the idea had first occurred to him. His soul sickened at the prospect, even while he smiled casually upon the manager. But he had a wife and family to keep, and for the past month, he had found almost no newspaper work. Here was a chance not to be missed the price of a special story in the morning echo with a five-pound note to add to it. It meant comparative wealth and luxury for a week and freedom from the worst anxieties for a fortnight. Besides, if you wrote the story well, it might lead to an offer of regular employment. So, he said to the manager, I, uh, I've already promised myself an uncomfortable night because your murderer's den is obviously not fitted up as a hotel bedroom. But I don't think your waxworks will worry me much. You're uh, not superstitious. Not a bit. But you're a journalist. You must have a strong imagination. Well, the news editors for whom I work have always complained that I haven't any. Well, there is one condition I'm afraid I must impose upon you. I must ask you not to smoke. Yes, we had a fire scare down in the murderer's den earlier this evening. 
I don't know who gave the alarm, but it was a false one. <laughs> Fortunately, there were very few people down there at the time, or there might have been a panic. And now, if you're ready, <clears throat> we'll go. Well, Houston followed the manager through half a dozen rooms where attendants were busy shrouding the wax figures. Beyond these rooms was the murderer's den. It was a room of irregular shape with a vaulted roof. By design, an eerie and uncomfortable chamber whose atmosphere invited its visitors to speak in whispers. The waxwork murderers stood on low pedestals. The manager, walking around with Hewson, pointed out several of the more interesting of these unholy criminals, and Hewson pointed and whispered, Who's that? Oh, <laughs> I was coming to him. Hey, come and have a good look at it. Oh, well, this is our star boarder, Dr. Boudin. Hmm? Uh -huh. Yes, I think I've heard the name, but I forget in connection with what. Well, you'd remember better if you were a Frenchman. For some long while, that man was the terror of Paris, yes. As he carried on his work of healing by day and throat cutting by night. When the fit was on him, he killed for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him to kill. And always in the same way, with a razor. <laughs> After his last crime, he left a clue behind which set the police upon his track. One clue led to another, and before very long, they knew that they were on the track of the Parisian equivalent of our Jack the Ripper. But when he realized that the police were closing about him, he mysteriously disappeared. And ever since, the police of every civilized country have been looking for him. Hmm. Yes, well, I don't like him at all. Oh, what eyes he's got. Yes. This wax figure is a little masterpiece. You, uh, uh find the eyes uh, bite into you? you? Well, now, that excellent aerial is in. Bob Bourdet practiced mesmerism and was supposed to mesmerize his victims before, before dispatching them. Oh, I thought I saw him move. <laughs> yes. You will have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect. You, uh, you shall be locked in. You, you can come upstairs when you've had enough of it. <laughs> well, good night, Mr. Sir Houston. Good night. I'll, uh, I'll see you in the morning. The manager left, and Houston got that ready for the night. We wheeled the armchair a little bit down the central gangway and deliberately turned it so that its back was toward the effigy of Dr. Bourdet. For some undefined reason, he liked Dr. Bourdet a great deal less than his companions. Busying himself with arranging the chair, he was almost lighthearted. But when the attendant's football balls had died away and a deep hush stole over the chair, he realized that he had no slight ordeal before him. The gym... And when wavering light fell on the rows of figures, which were so uncannily like human beings that the silence and the stillness seemed unnatural and even ghastly. The eyes of Dr. Bourdet's effigy haunted and tormented him, and he itched with a desire to turn and look. At last he could stand it no longer and quickly look behind him. Among the many figures standing in the stiff of unnatural poses, the effigy of the dreadful little doctor stood out with a queer prominence. Houston looked into the doctor's eye for one agonized second and turned again to face the other direction. It struck him in the moment or two while he big looked behind him that there had been the least subtle change in the grouping of the figures in front. Houston held his breath for a moment and then drew his courage back to him as a man lifts the weight. He remembered the words of more than one news editor and laughed savagely to himself, saying, Yes, and they tell me I've got no imagination. <laughs> he thought this was very cowardly and very absurd. They were only waxworks, and they couldn't move. Let him hold that thought, and all would be well. But then, why all that silent unrest about him? A subtle something in the air which didn't quite break the silence and happened whichever way he looked just beyond the boundaries of his vision. Suddenly, he heard somebody breathing. He swung around quickly to encounter the mild but baleful stare of Dr. Burdett. No change. Oh, this was a little too much. It was bad enough that the waxwork effigies of murderers should move when they weren't being watched, but it was intolerable that they should breathe. Somebody was breathing. Or was it his own breath which sounded to him 
as if it came from a distance. He sat rigid, listening and straining until he exhaled with a long sigh. His own breath, after all, or if not, something had divined that he was listening and had at that moment ceased breathing. Now, this would not do. This distinctly would not do. He must clutch at something, grip with his mind upon something which belonged essentially to the workaday world, to the daylight London streets. He was Raymond Hewson, an unsuccessful journalist, a living and breathing man. And these figures grouped around him were only dummies, so they could neither move nor whisper. Still, the gaze of Dr. Bourdet urged, challenged, and finally compelled him to turn. Hewson half turned and then swung his chair so as to bring him face to face with those dreadful hypnotic eyes. Hewson's own eyes were dilated and his mouth lifted at the corners in a snarl. And then Hewson spoke and woke a hundred sinister echoes. You move, blast you! Yes, you did, and I saw you! And then he sat quite still, staring straight before him, like a man found frozen in the Arctic snows. Dr. Burdett's movements were leisurely. He stepped off his pedestal with the mincing care of a lady alighting from a bus. He stepped off the platform and sat down on the edge facing Hewson. And then he nodded and smiled, and he said, Good evening. He spoke in perfect English with only a trace of foreign accent. I uh, need hardly tell you that not until I overheard the conversation between you and the worthy manager of this establishment did I suspect that I should have the pleasure of a companion here for the night. Now, you cannot move or speak without my bidding, but you can hear me perfectly well. Now, something tells me that you are, shall I say, nervous? My dear sir, have no illusions. <laughs> I am not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Boudet himself. Uh, let me explain. Uh, circumstances with which I need not fatigue you have made it desirable that I should live in England. I was close to this building this evening when I saw a, a police regarding me a bit too curiously. So I mingled with the crowd, and I came in here, and an inspiration showed me a certain means of escape. I raised a cry of fire, and then when all the fools had rushed up the stairs, I stripped my effigy of the caped coat, which you behold me wearing. I donned it, I hid my effigy under the platform at the back, and I took its place on the pedestal. I own that I have spent a very fatiguing evening. But fortunately, I was not always being watched in opportunities to draw an occasional deep breath and ease the rigidity of my pose. Oh, but one small boy screamed and exclaimed that he saw me moving. I understood that, that he was to be whipped and put straight to the bed on his return home, and I can all hope that, that the threat has been executed to the letter. I... Uh, I'm obliged with the chance which brought us to the tonight. And then perhaps it would seem ungrateful to complain. Uh, from motives of personal safety, my activities have been in some, somewhat curtailed of late years. And I am glad of the opportunity to gratify my somewhat unusual whim. But uh, you have a skinny neck, sir, if you will overlook a personal re remark. I should never have selected you from choice. I like men with thick necks. Thick, red necks. Uh, this, uh, which I have in my hand, is a little French razor. They're not much used in England, but perhaps you know them? Yes, one stops them on wood. The blade, you will observe, is very narrow. They do not cut very deep, but deep enough. In just one little moment, you will see for yourself. No. My friend, you will have the goodness to raise your chin a little. Oh, thank you. A little more. Just, just a little more. Ah, thank you. Merci, monsieur. Ah, merci, merci. In the morning, the sunrise began to mingle with the subdued light from the electric bulbs. 
And this mingled illumination added a certain ghastliness to a scene which needed no additional touch of horror. The waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places. In their midst, on the center gangway, Fusion sat still, leaning far back in his armchair. His chin was up-tilted, as if he were awaiting to receive attention from a barber. And although there was not a scratch upon his throat, nor anywhere on his body, he was cold and dead. His previous employers were wrong in having him credited with no imagination. Dr. Bordet, on his pedestal, watched the dead man unemotionally. He didn't move, nor had he moved. After all, how could he? He was only a waxwork. That was Nelson Olmsted and the story, The Waxwork, by A.M. Burridge. And now you have a second tale for us? Indeed I have been. You know the human mind reacts peculiarly under great stress, especially when overcome with fear. It ceases to be normal and goads the body onto fantastic acts of bravery or cowardice. Ambrose Bierce expressed this condition in many of his fine short stories. And the narrative I want to bring you now is about a man whose great fear was the last reaction of his life. It's entitled, The Man and the Snake. Stretched at ease upon a sofa in gown and slippers, Parker Brayton smiled as he read from Morrister's Marvels of Science. It was an ancient book with its archaic English, which stated, It is a veritable report and attested of so many that there be now of wise and learned none to gainsay it, that ye serpent, his eye, hath a magnetic property, that whoso falleth into its suasion is drawn forwards in despite of his will, and perisheth miserable by ye creature his bite. <laughs> Brayton smiled again as he thought, <laughs> The only marvel in the matter is that the wise and learned in Morrister's day should have believed that snakes could hypnotize their human victims. And a train of reflection followed. For Brayton was a man of thought, and he unconsciously lowered his book without altering the direction of his eyes. As soon as the volume had gone below the line of sight, something in an obscure corner of the room recalled his attention to his surroundings. What he saw, in the shadow under his bed, was two small points of light, apparently about an inch apart. They might have been reflections of the gas jet above him in metal nail heads. He gave them but little thought and resumed his reading. A moment later, something, some impulse, which it didn't occur to him to analyze, impelled him to lower the book again and look for what he saw before. The points of light were still there. They seemed to have become brighter than before, shining with a greenish luster that he had not at first observed. He thought, too, that they might have moved a trifle were somewhat nearer. They were still too much in the shadow, however, to reveal their nature and origin to an indolent attention. And again he resumed his reading. Suddenly, something in the text suggested a thought that made him start and drop the book for the third time to the side of the sofa, where, escaping from his hand, it fell sprawling to the floor, back upward. Brayton, half-risen, was staring intently into the obscurity beneath the bed, where the points of light shone with, it seemed to him, an added fire. His attention was now fully aroused, his gaze eager and imperative. It disclosed almost directly under the footrail of the bed the coils of a large serpent. The points of light were its eyes. Its horrible head, thrust flatly forth from the innermost coil and resting upon the outermost, was directed straight toward him. The definition of the wide, brutal jaw and the idiot-like forehead serving to show the direction of its malevolent gaze. The eyes were no longer merely luminous points. They looked into his own with a meaning, a malign significance. A snake in a bedroom of a modern city dwelling, of a better sort, is happily not so common a phenomenon as to make explanation altogether needless. Harker Brayton, a bachelor of 35, returning to San Francisco from all manner of remote and unfamiliar countries, had gladly accepted the hospitality of his friend, Dr. Druring, the distinguished scientist. Dr. Druring's house, a large, old-fashioned one in what is now an obscure quarter of the city, had an outer and visible aspect of proud reserve. It plainly would not associate with the contiguous elements of its altered environment and appeared to have developed some of the eccentricities which come of isolation. One of these was a wing, 
which was a combination of laboratory, menagerie, and museum. It was here that the doctor indulged the scientific side of his nature in the study of reptiles. He loved nature's Bulgarians and described himself as the Zola of zoology. His wife and daughters not having the advantage to share his enlightened curiosity regarding the works and ways of our ill-starred fellow creatures were with needless austerity excluded from what he called the snakery. Architecturally, and in point of furnishing, the snakery had a severe simplicity befitting the humble circumstances of its occupants, many of whom, indeed, could not safely have been entrusted with the liberty that is necessary to the full enjoyment of luxury, for they had the troublesome peculiarity of being alive. In their own apartments, however, they were under as little personal restraint as was compatible with their protection from the baneful habit of swallowing one another. And as Brayton had thoughtfully been appraised, it was more than a tradition that some of them had at divers times been found in parts of the premises where it would have embarrassed them to explain their presence. Despite the snakery and its uncanny associations, to which indeed he gave little attention, Brayton found life at the Druring Mansion very much to his mind. Beyond a smart shock of surprise and a shudder of mere loathing, Mr. Brayton was not greatly affected by the sight of a huge snake under his bed. His first thought was to ring the call bell and bring a servant. But although the bell cord dangled with an easy reach, he made no movement toward it. It had occurred to his mind that the act might subject him to the suspicion of fear, which he certainly didn't feel. He was more keenly conscious of the incongruous nature of the situation than affected by its peril. It was revolting, but absurd. The reptile was of a species with which Brayton was unfamiliar. Its length he could only conjecture. The body at the largest visible part seemed about as thick as his forearm. In what way was it dangerous, if in any way? Was it venomous? Was it a constrictor? He didn't know. Brayton rose to his feet and prepared to back softly away from the snake without disturbing it, if possible, and through the door. Should the monster follow, a rack of murderous oriental weapons hung in the wall from which he would snatch one to suit the occasion. Brayton lifted his right foot free of the floor to step backward. That moment, he felt a strong aversion to doing so. He lifted the foot a little higher by slightly bending the knee and thrust it sharply to the floor an inch in front of the other. He couldn't think how that occurred. A trial with the left foot had the same result. It was again in advance of the right. His hand was grasping the back of a chair, the arm was straight, reaching somewhat backward. One might have said he was reluctant to lose his hold. The snake's malignant head was still thrust from the inner coil as before, the neck level. It hadn't moved, but its eyes were now electric sparks radiating an infinity of luminous needles. Brayton had an ashy pallor. Again, he took a step forward, and another, causing his hands to knock the chair over with a crash. The man groaned. The snake made neither sound nor motion, but its eyes were two dazzling suns. The reptile itself was wholly concealed by them. They gave off enlarging rings of rich and vivid colors, which at their greatest expansion successively vanished like soap bubbles. They seemed to approach his very face and again were an immeasurable distance away. He heard somewhere the continued throbbing of a great drum with desultory bursts of far music, inconceivably sweet, like the tones of an alien harp. He knew it was the sunrise melody of Memnon's statue, as though he stood in the Nile-side reeds, hearing with exalted sense that immortal anthem through the silence of the centuries. The music ceased. Rather, it became, by insensible degrees, the distant roll of a retreating thunderstorm, a landscape glittering with sun and rain stretched before him, arched with a vivid rainbow, framing in its giant curve a hundred visible cities. In the middle distance, a vast serpent, wearing a crown, reared its head out of its voluminous convolutions and looked at him with his dead mother's eyes. Suddenly, this enchanting landscape vanished at a blank. Something struck him a hard blow upon the face and breast. He had fallen on the floor. The blood ran from his broken nose and his bruised lips. For a moment he was dazed and then stunned and lay with closed eyes, his face against the floor. In a few moments he had recovered and then realized that his fall, by withdrawing his eyes, had broken the spell which held him. He felt that now, by keeping his gaze averted, he would be able to retreat. But the thought of the serpent within a few feet of his head, yet unseen, perhaps in the very act of springing upon him and throwing its coils around his throat, was too horrible. He lifted his head, stared again into those baleful eyes, and was again in bondage. What ensued was a fearful scene. The man, prone upon the floor, 
within a yard of his enemy, raised the upper part of his body upon his elbows, his head thrown back, his legs extended to their full length. His face was white between its gouts of blood. His eyes were strained open to their uttermost expansion. There was froth upon his lips. He dropped off in flakes. Strong convulsions ran through his body, making almost serpentine undulations. He bent himself at the waist, shifting his legs from side to side, and every movement left him a little nearer to the snake. He thrust his hands forward to brace himself back, yet constantly he advanced upon his elbows. Dr. Druring and his wife were at this moment in the library. Their conversation was interrupted by a mighty cry which rang through the silent house like the voice of a demon shouting in a tomb. Again, and yet again, it sounded with terrible distinctness. They sprang to their feet. The man confused, the lady pale and speechless with fright. Almost before the echoes of the last cry had died away, the doctor was out of the room, springing up the staircase two steps at a time. In the corridor in front of Brayton's chamber, he met some servants who had come from the upper floor. Together, they rushed at the door without knocking. It was unfastened and gave way. Brayton lay upon his stomach on the floor, dead. His head and arms were partly concealed under the foot rail of the bed. They pulled the body away, turning it upon the back. The face was daubed with blood and froth. The eyes were wide open, staring, a dreadful sight. Well, he died in a fit, said the scientist, bending his knee and placing his hand upon the heart. And while in that position, he happened to glance under the bed. Well, good Lord, how did this thing get in here? And he reached under the bed, pulled out the snake, and flung it, still coiled, to the center of the room, where it slid across the polished floor till stopped by the wall, where it lay without motion. It was a stuffed snake. Its eyes were two shoe buttons. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right. Isn't it? Now here is Nelson Olmstead to tell us about next week, Mr. Olmstead. Well, Ben, two ghost stories. One is by Christopher Isherwood, about a man who, for reasons he doesn't understand is able to get brief glimpses into the future. It's entitled, I Am Waiting. The second, Brownian Farm by A.M. Burridge, might best be described as an old-fashioned ghost story about a haunted house. You have been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Kenneth McGregor. Mr. Armstead's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Armstead will again be here in person, this is Ben Grauer bidding you good night.